you, Michael. Um, could we have a little, do a little more light that I, so I could just see a little better here? It's a little dark, and we, I don't have slides, so I'm just gonna, uh, if it's, I'll make it out if it's a problem. But I, I should correct uh, that it's a little bit outdated CV. I'm no longer chair of the history department. I've been roped into a higher level administration at Harvard. I've just become the dean at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Studies. So um, now I'm deeply uh, involved in administrative matters. Thank you, that's, that's much better. So I'm very happy to be here and very pleased to welcome all of you. Today we're gonna to hear from two distinguished architects about their involvements in two major Boston uh, regional projects that were imagined and in one case actually undertaken in the 1960s and the 1970s. Expo 76, which will be discussed by Jan Wampler, um, and the MBTA modernization project, which will be discussed by uh, Chuck Redman, and that's the one that, as you know, was built, not Expo 76. Before we begin, I thought that I would set tonight's discussion into uh, some context. Um, as most of you here surely know, Boston underwent a major urban redevelopment in the 1960s, continuing into the 1970s. Um, the leaders of the city uh, were uh, struggling with a, a city that seemed to be dying, uh, deteriorating, and they sought to take advantage of federal dollars that were available uh, for urban redevelopment to make a transition to a newer kind of economy, and a crucial part of their strategy was to rebuild uh, Boston's downtown. This was the new Boston that Michael was referring to. Um, now, Boston was very similar to many other cities at the time. This was not uh, anything distinctive. Uh, uh, most uh, older cities were undergoing a similar kind of process and taking advantage of the federal government's willingness to invest in large-scale redevelopment. Now, while this was happening, uh, and certainly thereafter, there was a lot of criticism of the wholesale demolition uh, and the damage that was done to the existing fabric, in many cases historic fabric, of cities like Boston. You're probably all familiar with the most famous uh, person, uh, Jane Jacobs, who um, in her Death and Life of American Cities um, made the case for uh, against planners and for instead respecting the organic sort of development of cities and not intervening into them. And for a long time, that was pretty much the prevailing view, that urban renewal uh, scale uh, interventions were a mistake and that a Jane Jacobs-oriented sensitivity to just letting things develop and not intervening was, was really a, a, a preferable way of going at it. More recently, however, and this is pretty recent in the last few years, some historians and some critics, um, urban critics and urban thinkers, have returned to the larger issues and have started to critique the critique, if you will. Um, and their goal, I think, has not been so much to, um, to defend the insensitive kinds of actions that were taken during urban renewal. I don't think that that's really the goal here. Um, but they do want, uh, I think Americans, urban dwellers, urban policy people to, to really think again about uh, some of the benefits and advantages that might have been forgotten and are underappreciated in an era that has sort of rejected large scale uh, spending and large scale interventions. And some of the things that they have asked that we think again about include uh, conf having confidence that government can actually make a difference uh, and particularly can um, aim to make the city a better place for a, a lot of people to live. Um, willingness to spend, for the federal government particularly, but government more generally, to spend money um, on cities, um, to rethink and to rethink some of the negative outcomes that have come from the prevalence of a kind of dismissal of that level of intervention. And the kinds of things here that I would mention would be a kind of retreat from large-scale planning, um, for, from um, a, a kind of dependence on the private sector to drive development rather than to articulate sort of larger goals and balance the public and the private uh, somewhat better, 
And a, a, the current reality that anybody who lives in American cities, particularly certain American cities, is confronted with every day, which is a crumbling infrastructure um, uh, that you know, nobody is really addressing and very few people want to pay to address. Um, this is a, a kind of investment that John Kenneth Galbraith in the 1950s referred to as the social uh, goods that American consumer society needed to value more, he felt. And uh, we, know, we live in a time now when, it's, when we have a very much private sector driven development that it's very hard to articulate and pay for social goods that may not in fact return profits to the private sector. So in this context of you know, returning perhaps to uh, to, to looking uh, in new ways at, the, at what happened uh, in this period, in the 1960s and 70s, I think we can learn from the two projects that we're going to hear about this evening. The MBTA modernization, which did take place, and Expo Boston 76 that did not. But I use them, I hope, to, to, to perhaps um, bring some more nuance and, and subtlety to our assessment of the benefits and limitations of the kind of planning and um, in interventions that happened in the past, and then perhaps apply them, find the lessons of them for the future, and in, for Boston in particular. Now let me introduce you to our two speakers. Each of them will speak for about 10 minutes, um, and then we'll have a question and answer. I may ask a question to get us going, or we'll just, if you have questions, we'll just start and then I'll come in later. But let me start, introduce first Jan Wampler, professor of architecture at MIT. He received his BS in architecture at the Rhode Island School of Design, and a master's in architecture and urban design from the Harvard Graduate School of Design. He was awarded the honor of distinguished professor from the Association of Collegiate Schools of Architecture, and has received awards from MIT for his work in international programs. In addition to teaching, Jan runs a small architectural office. His interests are in design, the understanding and designing of the space between buildings, as well as buildings that can respond to people's needs. From 1968 to 1970, he was the principal designer for the Expo Boston 76 project for a World Bicentennial Exposition in Boston, supported by the Boston Redevelopment Authority under urban design director Charles Hilgenhurst. Jan is the author of All Their Own, People and the Places They Build, which was first published in 1976. His articles and buildings have appeared in numerous architectural magazines, including Progressive Architecture, L'Architecture d'Aujourd'hui, A&U Architecture, and Space and Society. A retrospective of 25 years of his work was shown at the MIT Museum in 1996, titled Open Strings for E, Search on the Journey. And Jan was the chief architect for Expo Boston 76. Chuck Redman uh, is principal at Cambridge Seven Associates. He holds a BS and Bachelor of Architecture from Rice University and has been a member of the board of directors of the Boston Architectural College since 2002 and board chairman from 2003 to 2007. He received the National AIA Edward C. Kemper Award for Service to the Profession in 1985, the Award of Honor from the Boston Society of Architects in 2002, and the Distinguished Alumni Award from Rice University in 2006. Um, and he tells me that he also sits on the Dean's Advisory Council at Rice. He currently serves as an overseer in the Boston Architectural Co to the Boston Architectural College, and then, as I just said, was on, is on the advisory panel at Rice. Uh, School of Architecture. As principal at, of Cambridge 7, uh, Chuck has directed numerous interdisciplinary teams on a wide range of projects, including transportation centers, aquariums, museums, office buildings, hotels, and academic buildings around the world. He's been very active in the Boston region uh, on local issues around transportation, growth, and urban design, and is currently involved in the Boston Museum next to the Rose Kennedy Greenway. There was something right on NPR today about that. He uh, has also consulted on community development and urban design issues in the UK, Italy, Yugoslavia, Germany, and Kuwait. Chuck's recent projects include the Yawkey Center for Outpatient Care at Mass General in Boston, a new science museum um, in Rihad, Saudi Arabia, and several projects in Kuwait, including university and college campuses, a major waterfront redevelopment, and a new 
development in a new science museum and aquarium. And Chuck was the principal at Cambridge Seven Associates for the MBTA modernization project. So I think we're going to start with Jan, and then we'll go to Chuck. Thank you. And um, it's a great honor to be here tonight. I'd like to say a couple things to start with. First of all, I'm not from Hollywood. I'm wearing these sunglasses because I just had my eyes examined. And I have a coat and scarf on because I just came from Florida. And you think it's warm up here, but I think it's cold. So please excuse me. Um, I'd like to start by thanking all these people that are sitting over here for the wonderful <coughs> exhibition that they have done outside. I just saw it for the first time 10 minutes ago. And frankly, I learned things that I didn't know about what had been done. So it's a beautiful uh, exhibit that you put together. And I thank you for digitizing about, uh, I don't know, a couple hundred of my slides. I would like to give just a little bit of background, uh, because I think this tells the story very well, uh, of the uh, project. First of all, I worked at BRA after I came out of LISD for two years, and with people like Tony Lee, who is here, and Craig Sabucci, and Gary Allen's and a number of other people, we all uh, sat in the same room. Um, and then um, I went off to uh, South America. I wanted to design housing for the poor. And I found out that there were many problems around South America, that there was no money. And I ended up in Puerto Rico where there was money and the same problems. And then uh, after two years, uh, I needed a job back in Boston. And I think I called up Charles Hogan and asked if there was a job, and if there was. And I came, and I um, start now by saying that uh, my first assignment of that job um, was to draw a uh, perspective of what the expo might look like using Montreal's expo as an example. Uh, and I kind of balked at that a little bit and um, asked if I could have uh, a couple weeks to try out a different idea. Based a little bit on, or quite a bit, on what I had seen for the first time in South America, the issues of the urban world. What I didn't want to see is what you see here for the uh, expo, which is uh, ice cream in the shape of American flags and cleaning off the monuments, which is exactly what did happen in 1976. So I didn't get very far. Um, so that was the kind of the beginning. And after two weeks, then I remember a meeting with Ed Logue, uh, sort of looking uh, typical Ed Logue looking at me, me being scared completely of what he's going to say. And uh, he said, all right, get out of here. And, uh, come back in, I think, six weeks, and we'll see. So he kind of liked the idea, uh, but not really. And the idea is, is about what I'm about to show you. I didn't think, let me go back. I want to introduce two people who worked on this that's in the room that I've seen. Malcolm McKenzie, sitting right there and Charles North, who were part of the team that worked on this, and I'll hand off myself by saying that in those days, the, uh, the, the saying was, never trust anyone over 30. <laughs> so everybody that worked on this, and there were a number of people uh, over the years who worked on it about three years, were all under 30, if I'm not mistaken. We're, including me, thank you. <laughs> I was 27 or 8. Um, so, I didn't think an expo should be like the one that everybody was talking about, Moses in uh, 1964, uh, because I thought it was a tremendous waste of money and resources. And worse than that is that companies like what you see here, U.S. Royal Tire, would make an exhibit in the shape of a tire, a uh, Ferris wheel. There's a uh, spaceship back there, and General Motors in the back built a car. And that just seemed to me to be the worst thing you could do with the money that was coming from Washington. As you probably know, Kennedy announced there should be a great exposition 
1976. He never said what city, but I think everybody thought it was Boston. However, Philadelphia and Washington thought differently a little later on, and for reasons I never understood, Miami, Florida also thought that they should be the site for the expo. I never understood that. So I was more interested in expos such as the uh, one in London in 1851 of, of the Crystal Palace, uh, or the Eiffel uh, Tower, which came out of it, which was showing the best of technology at that time, and, and also structures that could be reused. So that was sort of the beginning of what I was considering. And it seemed to me that there were a tremendous number of problems in the country and in the world, and why couldn't the Expo be a vehicle to solve some of those problems? Uh, problems of, well, actually urban renewal and, and what urban renewal produced in some cities. Uh, problems, this, these slides are almost 50 years old, but they're still pertinent, <laughs> standing up. Uh, problems of pollution. Uh, problems of people being, this is still in the 60s, problems of people not being part of our society in different ways. Uh, the Lonely Man, it was a book that at that time it came out. So there were both physical, social, and economic problems. But it seemed to us that the Expo was a way that maybe could change that. And at the same time, I found it upsetting that in this country, you saw things like this, how to get gorgeous, where other people just were having problems having clothes. Or people that never tasted milk, and in this country, a full refrigerator. So if this country was so great in 1976, perhaps we could help solve some of these problems around the world. That was the premise at the beginning. Now, when I came to Boston, the site had already been picked in um, Columbia Point and Thompson Island, and at that time, part of Quincy. Um, I actually made a stab at a different site, we, uh, or suggestion, because Fred Salvucci had been talking about uh, the big dig for about 50 years, I think, and suggested that the exposition could have been on that lawn where the big dig would be. And therefore, you would have uh, buried the, the expressway and have a uh, exhibition at the same time. Needless to say, uh, it took Fred how many more years before that happened? <laughs> quite a few. And quite a few after that before it was built. So, but that idea Fred had, I think, about 50 years ago. So the site was already given to me, and I think it was also based on the idea that Montreal had just had one that was on the water. Uh, this are some of the, I'm going to go through these quickly because they're outside. These are some of the um, first drawings that were made um, with the idea that the exhibition would be a living place where you would come to live um, in the yellow here, this housing. Uh, UMass, which actually did end up here, would be educational. There would be theme pavilions uh, around. This is what we call the water plaza. Floating platforms that you see here. Uh, and recreation on Thompson Island. Now that was in the beginning showing Quincy. But Quincy didn't want any part of this. So we had to change the site to be completely in Boston, still keeping the idea of the water plaza and the housing and U of Mass and the floating platforms. Now the intention was very simple. Instead of countries showing how great they are, which is what happened in 64, or for that matter, in Expo in, uh, in Montreal, um, it was saying every country and every company has something to offer to the urban problems. And why not let them offer those in the exhibition to show them? For instance, at that time, Japan was probably the whiz in the world in terms of mass transit. And the idea was that they would build the secondary transit system that ran back and forth. Um, I remember, as an example, naively talking to some people from General Motors, that it would be nice, I was very naive, I still am by the way, but I was more naive then 
I remember talking to people from General Motors saying, gee, uh, instead of having a pavilion in the shape of a car, maybe you could design and build an electric car that people could use when they went to the expo. And they looked at me, and of course I was 28 years old, uh, sort of like said something like this, kid, um, we own a lot of the oil fields. Why do we want an electric car? <laughs> uh, incidentally, um, so each uh, a pavilion that you see here, there are in, oh, it's been a long time since I've talked about this. I can't get the point of the book. Um, each pavilion was dedicated to a particular things, such as education or housing, transportation, recreation, medical, recreation here. Um, and the intention was that people would do research from the time that we started, which was around 67 or so, um, for almost 10 years. And then they would exhibit the research that they had done uh, in the expo. And of course, the final line is that the infrastructure for the expo could be built with the money. And you take away the exhibits, and you'd have a new city. And I remember once again being naive, presenting that to the city council. And they coming back and saying, gee, kid, uh, you don't understand what's going on here. Uh, well, I guess I don't. Well, we want to get the money to build it. Then we want to get money to tear it down. And then we want to get money to rehabilitate it. So the notion of trying to save money you know, as an infrastructure was kind of uh, not exactly what they had in mind. But that was the basis of it. I won't go into detail too much except to say the actual exposition areas were very small, which you see in red and yellow in this. The rest was housing that people would live in when they came to the exhibition, or you amass it got built, finally, here, um, so that it would be a living experiment. So that during the um, exhibition, this pavilion, for instance, would be dedicated to medical research. And the issue was, if you remember, Johnson at that time said we had a, a war on cancer. We were going to solve cancer. We didn't quite do that. Um, but nevertheless, it occurred to me that if we could coordinate all the research, maybe we could. So this is an example of one of the pavilions. Now, the physical notion was quite simple. It was a set of tinker toys, uh, structures that you see here, that could be put together in different ways to make pavilions, but afterwards to be reused to make housing or community facilities uh, or commercial. So it was a very flexible kind of notion. It wasn't a, a static building. And here's some examples of models. These are probably Malcolm or Kinsey's hands or Charles Norris's hands that we made. Um, where the white was the infrastructure, parking, elevator, structure. And then you could build inside this a pavilion and then take it out, but keep the white. So here's another view of it and what you might have during the exhibition. And then, whoops, I hoped you might see what you might see afterwards, which would be housing and commercial. Um, another pavilion, this is the center. So if U.S. wanted to build a pavilion, uh, they uh, would build within the structure. And it was very interesting. And also, being naive again, I remember talking to the United Nations. And the third world countries were very excited about this idea. But the big five could care less. They didn't want to be part of something like this. They wanted to flex their own muscles. So this proposal was a little bit more modest for what the United States might build normally in an exhibition. It was centered around what we call the water plaza. You see the secondary transit going through. You see the structures. Um, another view of what it might look like. George Conley did all the perspectives of which there were numerous perspectives made of this. Um, again, uh, a view of it with the housing and the University of Mass in the main area, and then I hope we're going to see afterwards, oh, maybe not, what it would look like as a, a new city. So the intention would be that it would be a new city for about 40 to 50,000 people. Now, 
Um, I went through these very quickly because outside is much better than anything I could do. And they have all the digital images, right there, which was very nice of them. Um, but I want to say a couple things. Um, there were local political problems, for sure. One of them was a woman by the name of Louise Day Hicks. I don't know if anybody remembers Louise Day Hicks. I hope you don't. <laughs> I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that. Uh, she was uh, running for mayor at the time. And her uh, uh, saying was, you know where I stand. And that was also the time of great demonstrations against busing of people, particularly in South Boston. Now, she was upset. This is my opinion. She was upset because we planned a new subway line that would run through South Boston and then stop here and then run on down to Quincy. Uh, because, <clears throat> now I'm kind of speaking I guess not off the record, but it doesn't matter. Uh, we talked about the new city being affordable housing, and that meant something to her uh, in a very particular way. So she and about uh, 400 other people protested the exposition. And <clears throat> the city council was very scared that if they were for it, they went and voted out. So the city council, I think, was voting five to one or something against it. So we had our local problems, although the mayor supported this, and certainly the BRA and Gil Hood, who was actually very instrumental in this, Hood of Hood Milk. Does Hood Milk still exist? I, uh, Gil Hood was the, uh, I think, the founder of it. Um, so there was a lot of local support, and I would say that when we got to Washington for the uh, presentation to the committee, I was told that uh, Boston's proposal was the one that was most agreeable or accepted over Philadelphia, Washington, and Miami. And uh, I just was explaining to people we had a model of the shape of part of this room. It was uh, an incredible model of uh, triangular model of Central Park here. Uh, well, actually all of this, I suppose. And you press a button and show the existing, you press a button and show the expo, and you press a button and it would show the new city, which we then showed at the uh, committee in uh, Washington. But um, there were local problems and there were federal problems. Um, as you know, we were in a great war, and that's where all the attention went, and all the money went during that time. Um, so finally, um, unfortunately, it was not accepted, and of course it wasn't built, as you know, and it did end up to be exactly what I didn't think it should be, which was ice cream in the shape of American flag cleaning up monuments and shooting off fireworks. So it was, in my opinion, a great missed opportunity. It was also, and I don't think I thought of it at that time uh, to that extent, it was a major intervention into the city, or, or would have been, of a, if you wish, you could be critical, but a, as a visionary idea of what could happen to the city. Of course, these were the days of urban renewal, bad part of it, you know, by the way, just for the record, you know, uh, Ed Logue had nothing to do with West End, that was before. And a lot of people always associate the West End, the BRA, Ed Logue, and that wasn't the case, that was before. Um, so that, to me, was a missed opportunity. Uh, I'd like just to say that Boston had another great opportunity make something that to me would have been a bold move in the city on the level of Olmstead. Imagine if Olmstead had proposed the Central Park today or the Fenway. Never would have happened, never happened. Yet we're all, in my opinion, excited that we had that bold move. 
Um, the one I'm speaking about is the Big Dig. I think the Big Dig had a lot of potential of being a bold, bold move for Boston, which was not realized as much as it could have been. Now, that's not to say that I don't believe in community uh, action. I, do, I believe in it very much. It's only to say that I think there's a balance between the two that we have to have. I think all cities, uh, the public space and the nature of gestures that are, are there, are an echo of the city, and it's an indication of the health of the city. And if we don't have them, then I don't think we have truly a harmonious city. And I believe that's where we are now. And I think I probably used my 10 minutes up. <laughs> so I thank you very kindly. Uh, could I take one liberty? speaks to what Jan was talking about and show you something totally different before we talk about this, which was happening at the same time. The next one was happening. At the same time, Expo was being planned for Boston. We had been the architects for the U.S. Pavilion in Montreal and had lived with that city and saw how the struggle and the stress hit that city in order to pull off this grand adventure. So about a year after that, uh, I was still not a partner there, but young, my partners decided, wouldn't it be interesting to try to do a World's Fair in a totally different format? dispersing rather than focusing to try to lighten the load on cities. And so what happened out of this was a thing called Poet 76. And it essentially was to use the bicentennial, which everyone felt was going to be the focus for the fair, and then try to use it in a way to celebrate the country, not the city in particular. And so the idea was to take the original 13 columns celebrate 200 years of advancement or change. It didn't have the same kind of mission that your fair had, but it had, a, it had a, we felt it might have a, a very different kind of stress on the situation. So it would create a high-speed rail corridor reconnecting the colonies to the major cities as a birthday present to the country as part of the transportation system. And then disperse the fair at railroad stations and other places along the line. Uh, and so as you participated, you could go to sites, but also you could be on a journey, and part of the exposition would be in the train, and part would be at different locations, and so on. And I, I simply offer this as a, as a reaction to having gone through a major uh, event with a city, doing one pavilion amidst many pavilions, knowing the stress and effort they did, they, they couldn't finish all of it. And I think the burden, no matter whether it has a turnover, as Jan presented, that would be really beneficial to the city after it had gone, is a heroic undertaking for any city to undertake. The second thing I want to talk about very briefly, what did happen in Boston, was a different kind of celebration, not a world's fair, but basically a celebration of the city. And we were hired by Kathy Kane, who is the Director of Cultural Affairs, I think Kevin White, the mayor, to try to think about how you would treat Boston for this celebration. And our idea was really to allow for many, multiple entries into the city to provide for easy information and easy access to things, to take the city and use it as a discovery place in its own right. The Freedom Trail would have been would have left all the properties along it and splintered it with 15 million people over two years, which is what they projected. Um, think about doing it in a way that would be interesting and fun. Make it accessible so you could buy a guidebook or find things anywhere in the city. Invite anyone in the city and any place in the city to be a host and a guide and a tour guide as part of that. And essentially disperse that. A different kind of approach to a world's fair. And I think it would so it was really about what came out of it 
which is, is part of this exhibit, is the, uh, there were three major exhibits, one in Quincy Market before it became a marketplace, so 18th century one in the armory here that became the 19th century, and then of course Boston, which is exhibited over here, which became the 20th, 20th century. So it was, a, it was a way of trying to sort of have your cake and eat it in a way, uh, although we didn't quite do that. So that, thank you for letting me indulge. What I'd like to do is now go to why I'm really here. Is to talk about the work we did with the MBTA. Um, a little context about this. It was very, very interesting. Our office was 1965, three years old. We were doing a combination of garage editions and kitchen editions. Although we did have the Expo project going, and we had just been selected for the new aquarium at New England. Um, the Bond Society of Architects felt there was an opportunity in the transit system with Paris Hut, oddly enough, not the Department of Transportation, was giving money to the system for bettering it from the standpoint of how it affected and engaged the users, not the operators. And our office had, was a quirky firm that had industrial design, graphic design, planning, and architecture all together. And so the Boston Society of Architects, like the first Bob Sturgis, said, why don't you go to Cambridge 7? And that's basically what happened. Uh, these are nice quotes by my partner. He was actually the partner in charge of the project. I was not the partner in charge of the MBTA project. I worked on it extensively. I was a young architect that moved up here in 65 from Texas, never been in a big city, and I was sent to work underground for two years. <laughs> And I could get anywhere, anyone could get underground, but if you put me on the surface with yeah. this chaotic street pattern that Boston uh, celebrates, I was totally out of my element. Uh, I think it did, in a very interesting way, provide a kind of framework for people to understand how to use the system, work the system, but also for people to understand how the city was structured and organized. And that was really the the way we did it. If you remember, th this is what the 50s and 60s looked like. It was amazing. I mean, half of Boston was missing. Unbelievable. And if you go into the 90s, a lot of it's back, but it's not quite back right. Yeah. And, and we hope it will be back. Uh, and if you go, this is a Google map, so you can get pretty close to what's going on today. Uh, the Greenway is there. It needs to have a lot of encouragement and help to become the kind of, fulfill the dream that we all had for it, I think. It's still underachieving, in my view, in that. And so that was the context we were working in. This is what the MTA at the time looked like. <laughs> um, and we felt there were opportunities by investigating how we would modernize it. Our charge was to provide design guidelines for modernizing. And we felt if we could make it easy to use and more welcome, if we could provide simple ways to reorganize the station so you could get through them, orientation, connect that to the street service and back. Um, understand, we knew we had done a lot of work in moving people. We knew how to do that. We were very good at it. But at the end of the day, we think it actually it contributed to helping people if they drive by a series of Green Line stations and see the Green Line, they know where it is or if they're underground and they see something that gives them a clue as to what's up upstairs, they know where that is. Again, this is what the MBTA, MTA was. Not a very pleasant place to go. And, and, and I don't know how you could figure out what the name of this station would be other than board schools and, and IBM. Um, and certainly it wasn't quite user friendly. Uh, and it was confusing. You, you came in and you wanted to figure out how to get to Ashland or to Fields Corner, and you were told to win cash instead. Uh, total confusion. Uh, they had blended advertisement and signage and directional information all together, so you were desperate to really figure out where uh, you would go. And this proved to be one of, we, we uh, back up one minute, we, we were successful because of the general manager Your group have their names out here. Those two guys basically held off 
the objections to anything that were uh, and, and supported me, and they got it. It was very, very interesting. They took a personal interest. Because we had to tell them, you got to take them in all the ads and move them. That was like, we had to tell their sign painters union that you're going to think about new ways of making signs. We had to tell the people running the cars that you have to be different. We looked at, in different systems at the time, and there was some interesting information. We wanted to develop an icon that became a kind of figure piece that you could always recognize. Uh, there are many that, uh, that, have, that occur in different places. You know, some of them are very, very famous. But we had to get it beyond this sort of collection of wild topography. It had to be very simple and very recognizable. So that was the, the, the notion. So the T became the element that we chose to do that. And so I want to take you very quickly through some of the guideline ideas that we did. And, and, and then at the end, show you where we are or aren't with respect to the system. We developed a series of, of guidelines and manuals that dealt with everything from painting a bus to organizing signage to locating things to replanning stations. Um, and this ended up in four big books. Um, I, my job was to analyze 40 stations that would be renovated and redone. So I knew everything about these 40 stations. So the people in our office were working on, on other aspects of it. And these are the kind of drawings we did. We had drawings of all existing stations. We did kind of befores and afters. You know, if you, if you move the fare collection here to there, you change the circulation, it's a lot easier to use. So a lot of this was mining into how you make the stations and, and things work. Uh, we did a big analysis on all, there are four different types of cars on the system. There are different shapes and different shapes. So we tried to come up with a way for standing people and seated people to see where they are. So we came up with a, a, the double bands that we used, uh, the top and bottom bands, so a standing person can see this one, a sitting person can see that one. And that was the, sort of the language of what the graphics that we did. And we invented the colored lines. Um, that is a common way that many systems describe themselves. Red was. My partner went to Harvard, so he thought red was for Harvard. So <laughs> the green went through the, the Fenway and out, so that made sense. Blue went up the coast, and so that made sense. And yellow was taken as a safety color, so it meant orange for the remaining line. So that, it, I mean, it was almost as dumb and simple as that as to how they were chosen. It was very, very interesting. Um, the other idea we had was to use on the station walls some kind of graphics that told you what was happening upstairs. And so these early ones were basically photographs that we made black and white photo lips or they are put on porcelain enamel, they're durable, but they would give you a sense. And so when you thought about it, if you were Arlington Station, you have the beautiful, the shortest uh, suspension bridge in the world, but a very beautiful one in the garden. <laughs> Uh, and you had an image of it, and then you begin to think about how it worked, and it ended up on the platform. And so the idea was to, when you, when you were a rider, if you couldn't see the name of the station, how far, or if you saw an image, oh, I know where I am, I know where I'm going. And so that was the whole idea behind it. We took a crack at redesigning all the hardware. Uh, the turnstile, we designed a sort of heavy side on one side here that told you you had to go that way, rather, because if you confronted most of these, you weren't sure which way to go. It was very confusing. Uh, the turnstile itself, where you went through, was bullnose equal. So which side do you go to put your money in? You go to. So all of these were looked at from the standpoint of, of industrial design and wayfinding as a way of trying to think that through. So this is what resulted. This is the way Arlington became using the collection of these elements. Uh, we also had a chance to design the new uh, South Shore car because they were extending the line now to Quincy, which meant it was a long distance car, but also it became a short distance car as a rapid transit. So what kind of car that was. So we got very close uh, to winning that battle, but that eventually full new uh, produced a car that was probably 10% less than what we did. And then after that, we worked with the T to review work by other architects. Our idea was our guideline go out to the number of architects and the number of stations that would be renovated. And we would kind of act as a kind of oversight to that, which is good. And different 
you know, firms did graphics in a different way, some historic, government center, kind of celebrating government. The aquarium, you would confront, came down the escalator, you ran into a bunch of sharks, so you said, where you were. Uh, at the end of the day, we felt that this collection became a way of thinking about how you would get around the city and use the city and understand the city. Now, today, 45 years later, just to give you a little sense of what's happened, this was the original spider map that we did. It morphed when they added lines and so on. It further morphed and twisted. And this is the current graphic that T uses today. So it's almost illegible in many ways. Uh, and then if you buy a map who, that comes from anyone who sells things coming to the city, this is what you see. I mean, it, it's, it's sort of crazy <laughs> in an outrageous way. And then this was what we showed the T when we began our work. This is what's going on now. A new line has been introduced totally out of keeping with the character of the graphics of the existing system. Uh, bands are missing, uh, hardware next to things or so on. So the, the maintenance long term of this is not something that um, is, is, is happening. So we, we tried to do a proposal about five years ago to do a survey again and help them refresh the graphics and put it back into the presence, but they were not interested. Last slide is it looking forward to us. What are we going to be in the next uh, two or three centuries and so on? And maybe we will have to deal with a different kind of set of machines. So. Um, while you're all thinking of questions you want to ask, um, I thought I would get us started. Um, I've got a couple questions, but I'll start with one and we'll see what you all have to say. Um, because this is a crowd that's very interested in design, um, I wonder if you would think back on these projects and give us a sense of the, you know, what kinds of messages were conveyed in the design, design decisions that were made about the way people at the time thought about the future, about the past. After all, Boston was an old city with an, with an, an important history. Um, when you were you aware of negotiating between symbols that would remind people of that historic past, or was there was the the strategy to sort of make such a, a strong statement that uh, Boston was going to change and be future oriented and forward oriented that you really wanted it to be very modernist? So, if you go back, you know what unpack for us what the design can tell us today about the way people at the time thought about the city and how to use these projects to bring it uh, sort of forward. Well, let me, let me start. Can you, to, you want to can, can you hear me without this? Or do well, I they know? wanted us to use it. What do I do? It should be on. Is it on? Is it to hold something to make it on? It's like this little green light when it stops. It's not green light. Oh, this is, this is on. Cool. Cool. Got it. Uh, from our standpoint, we were most concerned about developing a graphic language, which is really what this, most of the design approach was about, to assist people to ne navigate and negotiate around in the system. And so we chose a very simple, and at that time, a new typeface called Helvetica, that we felt was quite timeless. And the idea was that it would be inserted in new and old stations and it would be kind of a background to the station. It would give you the information and the messages, but it wouldn't try to compete with the nature of the station and how it was done. Some of these go in old stations, some of them go in, into new stations. But it, it had to have a consistency of location and message size and information so it would perform its function. I think the Looking back at it, oddly enough, because we did a, a second project in, in Atlanta about 10 years later, I think our biggest error was not to go upper and lower case. Because when you think about all uppercase lettering and words, your, your mind quickly can understand the shape of a word if it's upper or lower case. You can read it faster with all one size and everything. It's, it's but that was the idea, it was to create a very, very simple system that you could apply 
inside and outside. Uh, it wouldn't be a great intrusion. It had a kind of simple symbol being the T that would sort of start it. And then to use the simple colors that you didn't have to know where the station, what the station was, but you had a sense of what people were approaching. Once you understood the, the anatomy of the city, uh, which we oversimplified with the system and the lines with the spider map, uh, if you lay it typically on a, on a, uh, a, a, a real map, it, it's, it's still sort of a spider web, but it's a lot more prettier and brighter than that. But we were trying to think about doing something Um, I think I have to put it in context a little bit to answer your question. In the 60s, two things were going on in the country. One was urban sprawl, uh, moving out into the suburbs. Um, the city uh, still wasn't a place to be, including where we are right now. Um, <clears throat> so the notion of new cities, new settlements, was current in many Jose, uh, Dean Jose Sir was designing the new city outside 128, 95. So <clears throat> I think what we were thinking of was more a new image for Boston in the sense of a new city. And more particularly, the Water Plaza, what we call Central Expo. I think we thought of as something like the Boston Common, a new gathering for people of that area to come together. People who are concerned about placement, uh, being anti-suburban, uh, uh, which was a big issue. So I don't think we were thinking so much about the history of Boston, but more about a new idea about what would happen in Boston. But really, in a strange sort of way, we were saying, oh, well, the Boston Common is the center of the old city. So we have questions. Uh, I can keep going, but um, I, I want to give people a chance to, to ask. I would ask that you, uh, Michael will bring the mic, that you introduce yourself uh, first before you ask your question. Hi, I'm Jeremy Wood, an architect, uh, probably educated pretty close to the same time you were. Uh, your plan for Boston uh, probably would be scary to the traditional people I'm surprised, you know, even at the time you were doing it, the age you were doing it, because I was probably close in age, that you didn't expect to scare the living daylights out of most people in Boston, which, you know, my, my folks originally came from here when there were cows walking around in very conservative ways. So, uh, <laughs> what, well, I'm surprised you didn't expect the reaction that you got. Knowing, knowing the way this place was. <laughs> I mean, it's just, I just find that very surprising. Mm -hmm. you got a rep like that. Um, well, as I have said many times, I was very naive. <laughs> An innocent historian. But um, Ed Lowe, was a vision in many ways. And we supported this project very strongly, as did the mayor, Kevin White. So from the uh, officials in Boston, I think it was accepted. I remember uh, being on many TV programs at the time and uh, calling talk shows. The issue was uh, not, as I remember, that this is a problem different than what we know in Boston. The issue was, would our taxes go up? That was the main issue, which they weren't, by the way. They would not be affected. Frankly, I think a lot of people saw it as a bold new idea for Boston. And uh, well, I understand there's a lot of conservatism, such as the University of Hicks, who has a lot of different ideas about it. I think uh, a lot of people did uh, support it in a general even though you're right, it's a very conventional place. So it wasn't, uh, I don't think it was the man on the street that was the problem. I think it was politics. Both local and political. Okay, 
Um, the 60s, I mean, I, I remember being at Rice University as an undergraduate in art history, 1960, 1964. And I think in 1963, I could have the dates wrong, we got the published results from the Boston City Hall Design Competition. It blew us away. It was unbelievable. And they built it, which is even more unbelievable. Because most competitions would go back into the tube and something else would happen. So I think, in a way, to, to us young architects, never been to Boston, so I had, didn't have family roots in Boston. I had family roots in Mexico and Texas and a few other places that probably um, would have similar concerns as some of the family roots here. But it was an exciting time. People were energized. It used to, so people working in cities and doing design were energized by kind of a hopeful, bold, near new future. Where you would take it, how it would go, how it would land, how it would integrate with existing city fabrics, open fields that haven't been uh, uh, gone in before was, was really the issue. So I think there was great optimism at the time, and, and in many ways, the, the plan that Jan showed more the BRA and the city put forth was a very, very optimistic view about what the potential of a new event of this scale could have for the city. So from that standpoint, I think it was very upbeat. I think at the same time, you know, will my taxes go up? You'd never be able to explain it all perfectly well enough to, to deal with that. Can it be done without breaking the bank and, and, and deferring a dozen other things in the city? Maybe, maybe not. We don't know. It's all about trade-offs in most most cases. It was a big undertaking. Um, could it have been done incrementally? Probably not, because you wouldn't get the money from the fair. It had to be done at this time at this place in order to leverage the funds. So it, it, it's sort of between a rock and a hard place in some ways. But I think from a design perspective, it, it was at the time when there was a great deal of optimism about people who were trying to rebuild and remake cities. Their views may not be popular with the general public, uh, as you would hope they would be. And the whole issue of the modern, the pushback on the modern movement, for example, which led to all kind of other crazy things in, in our profession, is, is a symptom of that. But I think you know it, it was of its time. It was it was a good idea, and, and, and I think it had support by the people who felt they wanted to move the city from one place to another place. Okay. Funny, Lee, I, I, um, I want to commend both of you for, you know, really, for the time. Uh, Jan's architectural stuff was far superior to the brutalist stuff that was going on at the time, much more flexible. And for Chuck, I think the MBTA, uh, you know, they're, they're brilliant in the fact that they're still working 45 years later is a testament to the, you know, terrific cover that design was. I think I have to add a little bit to the 60s and the uh, environment in which that's happening. Um, I think the city was changing. I think when you talk about tradition in Boston, it wasn't the old Boston and the new Boston. Um, there was our, the, the, uh, my reaction to the wayfinding was quite interesting because I grew up in the city. And in the city that was, uh, depressed and wasn't moving, we were all sort of stuck here. And all of us knew how to ride the, MB, the MTA. There's no need for signs. I didn't even look at the signs. I knew how to get around the city, and most everybody did. And that's why you don't have street signs in Boston. <laughs> <laughs> you cross the bridge at Mass Avenue, and it says Mass Avenue, and then there's not another sign until you get to Arlington. Because if you don't know it's Mass Avenue, it's too bad. But at that point, a couple of big social factors going on. One is the new people coming into Boston, yeah. and they were lost, and <laughs> you were part of it. And that was right, that there should be something done about that. Um, the other was 1968. Somehow, the black-white issue, you mentioned segregation and us, us think, but all over the country, the cities were coming under siege 
as the great migration of rural blacks into the cities began to encounter tremendous problems of housing, access, education. And in Boston, it was particularly rancorous because Carson Beach, which is on your piece, was a site of fighting between black residents of Columbia Point and South Boston residents. So th this was like throwing a little bit of kerosene on the, on the fire. And in some ways, it's like, and knowing your, your own, and make a comment on this, your own career, Jan, um, you've gone from this mega structure to working with disaster uh, people and your latest work is space between buildings. This is a very striking kind of change in, 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 in because I think that was the end of the time when big projects and architecture could solve problems, social problems. In some ways it was the end of an era. What was else happening at that time? The inner belt. We've cut a swath through Roxbury. Um, the, the West End was coming up. And so these large projects no longer had the magic they had 10 years previously. So unfortunately, this came at a time when the whole idea of a big project doing something for the city, City Hall was going up, and people were seeing that. So I think that, that you know, it's a kind of a timing piece that was unfortunate, and in a lot of ways, um, the role of you know, having in this setting is the role of architecture in, in, in social, you know, your, your ambition to solve the social problems were architecture. And I think we have, somehow that's the end of that era. And that was the beginning of marking it. Whereas I think the MBTA stuff was the beginning of another era. It's kind of interesting the juxtaposition of these two. Tony, I certainly agree with a lot that you have said. I want to make an observation also, though, now. Um, I'm very critical of our profession that I think is becoming more of technicians and not what I call creative leaders in terms of get throwing out ideas that are beyond just building. I feel as though uh, there's a number of younger generations coming along that are going, hopefully, to start talking about larger ideas, not just a building. And you're right, that was, it was sort of the, the beginning of the beginning at the same time. But I worry about our profession, um, as I just said, that is just concerned, and God knows it's hard enough to build a building but it's just concerned about doing what a developer or somebody who has money wants to do. So I think there's an there's a opportunity for some younger people to uh, take on a, a new role. Again, it's never changed from what you have. We have another question. Yes. Oh, sure. I see two more hands, so we'll... Yeah, sorry, Tony, I just wanted to talk to that issue and Jen brought it up. Quite well, um, you know we're 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 youngish, quite you know a decade older than you were when you did this thing, and we were asked to look at cities in other parts of the world, right? Like one of the biggest projects in our office right now is examining parts of Abu Dhabi and helping to reinstigate a a kind of emerging typology for a contemporary Arab city. Right, and here, there's there's just no the, the vision is gone, right? Like the the last master plan for Boston was really 76, 78, right? The, that book, the, the book that was produced, right? Right, um, right. right. Which is many decades ago, and there's there that the, the residual effects of that are being seen, right? Like the the courthouse is actually drawn on one of those master plans. Um, the, the removal of the post office is, is on those master plans. But the, the current situation in the city, or within policy or whatever, however you want to frame the, the problem, 
isn't allowing for um, anything beyond the developer mentality, right? And I, it, it, to, to us, it's a real problem because we want to think about the city and we would love to think about the city, but we can't find a way to financially support thinking about the city other than this, the, the exhibits that we, we produce here. Charles Norris, Norris and Norris Associates. Um, uh, to the point that you're just making, I, my question actually was, was to, to uh, uh, remind us that uh, the last formal master plan for the city of Boston was 1965. Yeah. Uh, and that document with the brown cover. And there are a lot of very innovative aspects of that of which the World's Fair was consistent. Uh, uh, there was a capital web theory, which I think is uh, was a, a essential aspect of the success of the revival of the city of Boston, which was to put investments in a limited number of places of which you could say the World's Fair was one and so forth, as opposed to trying to do everything everywhere. Uh, uh, going to, to one of the earlier questions, it also included preserving parts of the city that were of historic interest and putting investments in a limited number of new sites and so forth. The fact that we haven't had one, personally, I think, is because we invented in the urban renewal area era an entity which was has continued to be in a conflict of interest, which is the Boston Redevelopment Authority, which is responsible both for development and for planning, and they they're, they're, they're inherently at odds, and that is perpetuated and not just in Boston but in other places. I think we we could also look at the fact that in New York they've just come up with a waterfront plan, which is one of the first new plans citywide in, in, in New York. For decades and think about whether or not some of those elements of thinking on the larger scale may not be relevant again today. Let's Eddie Cooper. We have about 10 more minutes. I think there are some more hands. Let's hear some more. We've got man in the very back. Hi, I'm Mike Sweeney. Um, I'm a marketing writer with design and architectural training. So this is, of course, to me, I use the T every day, so lots of familiarity there. But my question is primarily for Jan. It's this: so um, you expressed that you were young, you were naive. It was the '60s and the '70s. You were a visionary, and you know these are good, solid ideas that came up against a great deal of uh, of uh, resistance and organized resistance at that. I'm really curious to know how you um, uh, moved on as a professional and personally from the ideas that you hoped to uh, accomplish in building for this project and all of your ambitions for Boston. And you know, how did you detach if you ever did? And how do you um, how do you interact with the current Boston that diverged from your hopes? Well, it's <laughs> um, it's an interesting question. It's a, it's a, <laughs> we could be here all night talking about it. But I, I had to take myself back 45, 50 years. And I remember, first of all, of being extremely depressed um, over the non acceptance of the world's fair. More depressed and very active anti-war movement at that time, which was just about that time after the fair was not going to happen. A lot of my energy went into uh, activism during that time. And the planning design group, which was the only two members were here, um, which I had started, we actually turned our energy, I'm not so sure anybody knows this publicly, but it's, it's okay, I guess. I'm not running for any office. Uh, we uh, turned our energy into building self-help parks and daycare centers um, around the city. So we went from the expo, which was large scale, to saying, OK, that didn't work at all. What can we do in our own backyard? And so a lot of our energy went into that. And my energy, uh, I, 
to start practicing in Jamaica Plain, and I consider myself as a family architect, so to speak. I did whatever projects came around. Uh, I've always been interested in trying to use architecture as a social motivator to change the world. And I'm still doing that. I'm working in China, I'm working in Ecuador, uh, different places. I'm not working in the United States. Well, nobody's working in the United States anymore right now. <laughs> um, but uh, I've sort of given up on the United States as a place where change can happen. And I sort of have said, well, maybe I can make changes in other countries, and then we'll see what that is. You know, a lot of countries are doing a lot better than we are. So that's a sort of short capsule and a very short answer to your very, very uh, long question. I'm actually trying to write a book about this. So thank you for that. I think we have time for one more question, if uh, anyone has one. Yeah, I'll just ask one more question. Hi, I'm Malcolm McKenzie, and I was a member of the Tiny Design Group, as Jan pointed out. I did have one comment just on what uh, Tony was saying about the end of an era, which is that if my dates are correct, I think that the country in, uh, in 1976 committed a more uh, notorious act of demolition than act of construction. I think that was the year that Pruitt Igo was, was demolished, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but I did want to ask about the World's Fair, um, something that goes perhaps back to its origins and then thinking about it uh, in the context of today, which is that you said the site was already established, and I, I guess I'd forgotten that, that the inclusion of the surround of that portion of the harbor was all part of the site. Um, and I'm wondering first if uh, everybody who picked that actually envisioned as much construction in the harbor as especially the original plans uh, showed when, when you know, Quincy was included. And secondly, that today I think the biggest change to something where where I think you know, a lot of the ideas of the World's Fair are as germane today as they were then, including the issue of urban sprawl, which you alluded to. But the attitude towards building on the water, building on the waterfront, has changed so much. I'm uh, just wondering if you, what, what would you do today? If, uh, <laughs> The, uh, the site was picked before we started. And um, I questioned the, the location of the site. Um, and it actually, as I said, I think I offered a couple other alternatives before we got started on that site. I think the reason the site was picked, first of all, is that Montreal had been a great success. And it was on water. So that's one of the reasons why the people picked it. I think also, um, the area seemed to be somewhat underdeveloped, and it was a way, this was a way of stimulating development. Uh, I think in addition, the notion of a center in the south part of Boston was an idea that uh, maybe I exaggerated, but I think was there also. Did they uh, think that it was going to be as extensive as it turned out to be? Your second question. Uh, I remember Bill Hood one day coming and looking at it. He said, oh my god, I didn't know this was going to be quite like this. So I think they didn't quite appreciate the extent of what we were doing. What would I do today? I wouldn't do a World's Fair. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, do you want to have any parting words here? Well, I mean, all you have to do is to go on Google Earth and go to Dubai and see these unbelievably large crumbling projects that are being built in the sea. Uh, it's hard work to build in the sea, no matter where you are. Okay, well, I think we're, we're at the end of our time. I, I'm going to ask you to join me in thanking our, our speakers for their very